the same as the last time. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello. It's really great to have you here. It's such a really um, positive feel in the room, and it's just awesome. So, you know, are you rah rah indeed? Okay. So, thanks very much for coming on your a Sunday evening. Um, we are joined this evening not only by your good selves, but also by our Associate Dean for Executive Education, Mr. Joe Sherpa. Right. And after a long weekend of rutgering, everybody's favourite macroeconomic professor. <laughs> Teaching macroeconomics, we have Dr. Ruth Langdammer. Tonight, I would like you to put your hands together for another really big occasion, which I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with. Um, I'd like to say congratulations to the class of 2017 for hitting the halfway point. Yeah. I'm sure we all remember what a slog that was. I know when I did my masters, I certainly did. Um, so yeah, that is a, a huge milestone, and you're stay in there, guys. Keep the power, keep the engine room running, right? Um, now, some of you may realise I am a, a new face to Rutgers. Um, I have been with Rutgers Business School Asia Pacific for three months now, so I'm still uh, relatively wet behind the ears. I have been here, uh, I've been tasked to uh, bring alive Rutgers, the community, and hopefully uh, the new programs that are being offered, you'll start to see rolling out through our email updates. Is everybody getting, well obviously you're getting our email updates, you're already here. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I really, really cherished coming on board with Rutgers is the opportunity to um, do executive education and work with the Ember groups. Some of that is because I am passionate about learning. I've always been passionate about learning my whole life. But I'm passionate with the way that we're engaging with business and, and with people that have that depth of experience and that we actually can learn off each other in, in the classroom or in social environments like this. And this is one of the, the driving forces behind my leap to Rutgers. Um, but coming on board, I wanted to put together three main, I, I guess, drivers for the next 12 months at least. Um, and that's going to carry us into some three year and five year plans, which we'll be discussing a, a, and announcing a little bit this evening. Um, the first of those pillars is around the idea of driving community and, and engagement with alumni and with students. And I hope to, events like tonight are more often. We've had some fun with some comedy nights so far with the, the students that are, are, are currently studying. Um, we're looking at you know, more alumni events where we do lectures. We are started a casual conversation series, which we have another one tomorrow, about how to leverage your, your Ember. Um, we have another one in September with one Rutgers alumni, um, who I don't think is here this evening, Matthew. Uh, Matthew Glitzer from IBM, and he will be talking about how to manage up, manage down, and manage across in your organization. Right, so we're looking at very relevant leadership topics as well as career topics for yourselves, and that's a momentum we, we really do plan to keep on carrying on with. Now, as part of the community, community needs a home. Yeah? And the home here is Singapore. Um, I've been in Singapore on and off for about 20 years. I love Singapore so much, I married one. <laughs> so for those that are wondering where the name comes from, yes, my husband is a Singaporean Indian, so um, you know, I, I'm well and truly entrenched here, I'm not going anywhere. But as part of that home building, I'm also building, um, looking at building a home for Rutgers itself. And we are currently evaluating a number of different opportunities. Some of those are standalone opportunities where we can actually have our own premises. And some of those opportunities to move in with some really interesting communities. And so some of the moves we're looking at are, are quite progressive. We hope you will keep an open mind and enjoy some of the announcements that are coming up. Um, but we're, we're actually looking at in making sure that we're able to introduce Rutgers to the community of Singapore and being able to leverage off the exciting um, pace that is inherent in this particular business community. Yeah? So we, we haven't finalised that, but as soon as that announcement comes out, we will be updating you all, and we hope we'll have a housewarming and all that as well. So, so that's the first pillar, it's about home and community in Rutgers. The second pillar I'd like to build on is awareness. Now, Rutgers is a very, very strong brand. Next month, you're, you, you may have received the invites already, and, and Joe will be talking a little bit about this. We have the, the 250 year anniversary of Rutgers, right? Which is, what, well, Chima. 
D. <laughs> All right, so 250 years, that's, that's quite astounding, but we need to really make sure that people are aware of the, the weight of that brand and, and the prestige and, and you know, the awesome learning that comes you know, with Rutgers graduates and, and just the attitude of Rutgers graduates. And you guys really impress me with your attitude, which is another reason why I come on. So we want to make sure that brand is increased and, and you'll be starting to see a few more messages around the community, hopefully, um, that will allow you to stand up and say, hey, that's, that's, that's me, you know, all right? So keep an eye out for those messages. If you feel like you want to be part of that, feel free to share anything we do on LinkedIn and Facebook and all the rest of it. Social communities count as well. Yeah, so help us with the branding effort there. Now the last pillar I have is around lifelong learning. And it's not one that, you know, it's not an issue that I've really encountered in this room tonight, but two months ago I got an email from somebody and we were talking about, you know, executive education and what the possibilities are, you know, for businesses. And they said, no thanks, I've done my master's, I just finished it last month, I'm done with learning. All right. Now, one of my personal values is, is change. And the ability to change is the ability to, you know, basically stay up with life, keep up with life. And I encourage you all to do lifelong learning. And by doing that, we're gonna offer some seriously deep discounts into executive education programs. So for example, we do the mini MBAs, so in your embers, you probably touched on a lot of different topic areas. We're offering mini MBAs to allow you to deep dive into all of those topics. And so we'll be, we started off with supply chain management, the digitized supply chain. We're going to be looking at social marketing and we're even going to have a, an executive development series as well. All right, so it's looking at a lot of really deep dive topics because I don't know about you, I did my masters 10 years ago and a lot of the topics that were relevant then have changed today. Right, we always look at the, the BBC website, will you be replaced by a robot? You know? <laughs> All right. So the ethos of lifelong learning is one I really want to instill in this community. I really want to make sure that you guys are able to take advantage of it. And so we're looking at offering $99 a day for executive education programs to alumni. Right? And in, for the first runs, we've even extended that to spouses. So you know, keep an eye out for these sort of things. We really are interested in promoting that. So I don't want to take up too much time, I just wanted to get a few announce, you know, announcements out about the, the direction that we're taking and how serious we are about it. What I'll do is I'll pass you over to Joe, and Joe will, will talk a little bit about that from the US perspective. But thank you very much for coming, I really appreciate your time. Some things don't change. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, how many Rutgers graduates are here? Raise your hand for your Rutgers. In fact, stand up here for Rutgers graduate, please. Wow. Very impressive. Thank you for coming back. How many were Rutgers graduates from New Jersey? Stand up, please. You have a few here in the room. Thank you for being here tonight. This excitement that you feel is just um, genuine. We've been talking about this for over a year with some of your esteemed EMBA grads. And I say, some things don't change, it's all about getting the right person in place. And I remember having these discussions with many of you. We said, we wanna bring on a new executive director. And we're about to make a few offers, and you all reminded me, make sure you have the right person. I can't tell you how confident I am that we have the right person, Stephanie. So Stephanie, congratulations. Now, I want to start with a video. I don't think there's any uh, sound, right? I just want to, and I'll, I'll just take you through this video, okay? Stephanie hit. So there's this little animal there. Let's call that little animal Rector Singapore. But wait, there's a big animal over here. Let's call that a big institution, another big institution here in Singapore. It's been here for a while, very comfortable. We're doing the same thing. You know, not, not too much innovation, nothing to worry about. Wait, there's more than one, I think. There's another large institution here in Singapore. All great <laughs> institutions of learning. They're doing fine, nothing to worry about. They've heard, oh wait, here comes this Rutgers. Well, who is this? So what's going on here? It's this little Rutgers, little Rutgers? What's happening? There's no way. Rutgers, Singapore's gonna handle these big guys. I don't think so anyway. Maybe we should cut away. Wait, wait, wait. They're back. Tenacious, innovative, coming up with new ideas, and there goes one of the best. 
And I think that makes the point, okay? So, we know, we know there's some fine institutions here. And we know we're 250 years old. We know we're the eighth largest, eighth oldest university in the United States. We have some amazing graduates, but Singapore doesn't know that. And I think a lot of people from Singapore see us as that little, it's a French bulldog, by the way. And, and that, was a, that was in California, and he's done it on a few occasions, believe it or not. So I think Singapore may see us as this little tiny animal. That's where we are now. Our, we hope to be one of those bears as well. And we will be one of those bears here in Singapore. It's gonna take time and effort. And how are we going to do that? We're gonna do that through brand. And branding comes through excellence. That won't change. And many of you know about excellence when you see Professor Langana teaching. We would suggest that we have the best faculty in the world as well. So excellence doesn't change and brand doesn't change by building excellent programs. We're also going to build brand through expansion. Uh, we are looking to obviously not only expand here, but make this one of our second homes. Since I met you last, I've been speaking to people in Buenos Aires. So we may go to South America. We're looking to perhaps go to Colombia. We may have some friends in the audience from Colombia. We have other schools approaching us now. A very well-known school in Canada has approached us and wants to think if we can partner. And remember, some of you have mentioned that we have a partnership with Notre Dame. It was a test run last year, and they came back to it this year and said, can we do it again? So we're going to expand the brand through excellence and expansion. So that's where we are, but you're not here to speak or to listen to me tonight. You're here to listen to, we talk about excellence, one of the best faculty members you will find anywhere on the planet he makes this notion of macro interesting, fun, but more than ever, he's made that connection, hasn't he, with all of you. I don't think there'd be 110 in this room if it was just Rutgers and not, oh, Farouk Langana's gonna be here too. We know that, and we have to build the brand past our friend Farouk Langana, we know, and he knows that as well. So we're so pleased to have Farouk back. Uh, Farouk, you have 45 minutes, he's been well, there's a few things he has going on. First of all, he slept with the masks on in Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> and so we stopped to get those masks, and I think they were the N95s, right? <laughs> so he said, I'm gonna go with the N97, it must work better. But the N97 don't get as much oxygen in, so he's been fainting most of the time. <laughs> different masks on. Then he claims to have a torn meniscus, and there's other things happening with uh, our friend, Professor Langana. But seriously, it's uh, an honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight. I look forward to speaking with most of you one-on-one -on -one if I can before you leave. We are so excited to be back in Singapore. So, 45 minutes about macroeconomics, and I hand it over to Professor Farouk Langana. Come on up, sir. How many of you have taken uh, like Farouk's class? How many of you have seen Farouk in action? Okay, right, great. How many of you have not? Okay, do you know what a whiteboard is? Okay, so <laughs> Professor Langana does not do PowerPoints and this stuff. Like, this is making him nervous already. It's making him nervous for the screens thing, right? And actually, in the New Jersey program, we are cutting back on PowerPoint pretty yeah. much for most of the courses. So we are making eye contact. We are doing it the hard way, the old-fashioned way. Um, so anyway, just FYI. Welcome, good seeing you all again, by the way. Thank you. Um, we're going to this one say that middle here. We're offering you right now, I think. So, yeah, okay, we're good. Great, thank you. So thanks for the kind introduction, and good seeing you all again. It's, a, it's like a kaleidoscope. You know, there are people who were in class with me this afternoon. So could you, so could you please stand up? I just take my hat off to you. I don't know how we are doing this. <laughs> They just have an exam, thank you. They just have an exam this afternoon. And then I have people who I taught in France over 20 years ago. So Justin and Tan, stand up please. So this, this is amazing. And France was different then. It's a changed country now. Am I amplifying? Can you hear me, more or less? No, we just lost you. It just went off. Okay, so. <laughs> See, they're all interconnected. And so, and so then, 
we have somebody who is not yet in the program. He's going to be joining us, well, hopefully soon. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. We have three people from the last open house. So welcome on board. All right, so this is going to be intense. There's an exam at the end. I don't know if Joe mentioned this. <laughs> and then your, your grade gets adjusted retroactively. Joe, you want to mention all that? I, I did not. <laughs> and as you know, I have brought my Marcos from New Jersey. America still makes something better than Asia. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put my blog site. Are you getting my emails, by the way? And are you reading them? That's also important. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to click on them, you know? And so I list my blog site here, but I have these blogs coming out, and I wrote one on Donald Trump and angry Americans. And it was just another blog, I thought, and this one suddenly had legs. It went all over. I was getting calls and reporters, and, and then my colleagues, my fellow economists, they were getting on Ben Arashay. But Farouk, what was that? What is this? Whose side are you on? <laughs> and I thought, whoa, this baby's got legs, you know? It's, uh, it's amazing which blog will fly and which will not, you know? And um, so suddenly there's a connection now between Brexit and the Brexit guy. What was his, what's his name? <laughs> yeah, and so he's hanging out with Donald Trump now. So I'm going, hey, I, that's what I said. There's a connection. And this Brexit. Angry Americans and angry French. So France has changed since we were there. You know, and so I'm going to take you there, but the premise is going to be very interesting. The premise is going to be that the free trade model, that's called the Ricardian trade model, that is the DNA of global free trade, and has been. Um, the WTO, European Union, NAFTA, they all are driven by this Ricardian trade model built by David Ricardo. Um, 1700s, and something called the Stolper Samuelson theorem a little later. And interestingly, The Economist magazine, the last few weeks, some of you noticed, has been doing these two page summaries of major economic theories. And so last week they did Keynes and the multiplier effect, which we did in class today. Okay, I'm looking there. Ah, you're still looking at me, you still read micro? Just <laughs> <laughs> say yes so I can go on. <laughs> Oh, you still remember? Well, you will. Well, after class, we do a quick review. <laughs> and so that's what we did that in class today. It's amazing. And the week before, lo and behold, it's the Stalker Samuelson theorem. And interestingly, I was surprised. They are now saying something that I said about three months ago. Something is broken. Something is dreadfully wrong in global free trade theory. This is a huge statement, it's a scary thing. I mean, because remember, when you outsource stuff, that baby is gone. And if it comes back, it comes back in a different form. It's never gonna actually come back. Those jobs are gone. And so there's a guy called Al Porcello, who is a student of mine. He's head of IT sourcing for Novartis. Al's a brilliant guy, a submariner, um, his best midterm ever in international trade. And so often when I start losing, last few years when I would start losing faith, I would call Al up and say, Al, Al, this still works, right? Because he's out there between, you know, talking to people in Bangalore and buying 6,000 laptops and outsourcing 6 million jobs. And so Al would go, yeah, yeah, bro, keep the faith. Yes, yes, it's trade is scary. It's a, it's, a, it's a matter of faith, it works. You know, and so recently I said, Al, and Al's hardcore trader. This guy's hardcore. I remember the midterm exam. Everybody was flipping out his closed book midterm like you guys had. People were all bouncing off the walls and Al was cool as a cucumber. I remember that. I said, Al, how come you're not nervous? And Al said, Farouk, when you're in a nuclear submarine, attack submarine, and you're locked in a death dive, and you're frantically trying to figure out the software so this baby doesn't go too deep and crushes you, that is stress. And I remember going, wow, and I think we hugged. It was an emotional moment. <laughs> it was an emotional moment. And so this time Al said, and Al's so hardcore, this is a true story, and I promise I'll get back into this thing. Al fired his grandmother. His grandmother was a telephone operator at Novartis. And Al said, according to trade theory, she's got to go. 
And my wife said, who is this jerk? He's a friend of yours? And I said, sweetheart, this, this guy understands straight theory. He fired his grandma. Some of you are going, this guy, we don't know about this guy. But that's the kind of hardcore trader. What happened is the grandma now watches his kids. So there's a, there's a whole, so, so now she can spend time with the kids. She's on a higher difference curve. She's happy. You know, the whole trade theory. <laughs> anyway, so I asked, talked to Al recently, and I said, Baroque, you know, you may have a point. This was a thunder blow. He said, something is wrong. This is a hard, he said, Farouk. And I said, so it's, something's not working. And I'm going to take you there. I'm going to give you the tip of the iceberg because this is a three credit course, which we are kind of talking about in 45 minutes. You know, but he said, Farouk, this is like engineering and physics. In physics, the ball always rolls down the hill at a certain speed at a certain time. So good saying again. <laughs> but in engineering, it's not always the case. There's a coefficient of friction. You know, there's maybe some, some vibrations. Engineering has the imperfections. It doesn't, physics is nice and clean. Engineering is messy. And so what, so what I've been going around saying is that we may have outsourced more than what we should have. You know, we may have outsourced, it became a copycat thing. Oh, so here I have five companies in America. Oh, my competition's outsourcing to Shanghai or Manila or Bangalore. I'm outsourcing too. It became a copycat thing. And so we may have offshore, offshoring is manufacturing going overseas, outsourcing is services going overseas. We may have outsourced and offshored stuff we should have kept at home. I'm going to Newark Airport, limo drivers telling me like, you know, Farouk, we have three generations furniture buildings from South Carolina. And I'm driving a limo now, three generations building amazing furniture, and I'm doing three jobs and making about 40% of what I used to make. And uh, he said, you know, you're a professor, you teach trade, and some, something's not great. I said, if, if the furniture coming in from other countries was great, cheaper and better, I would have said, all oh, right, good, I lost that battle. But the furniture coming from other countries is not good, he didn't use the words not great. And I can't use that word here. <laughs> it isn't. And there are so many sectors where the stuff that's coming in, you know, you're wondering, what did we do? My wife won't buy imported furniture, and we can't find furniture made at home. So we buy furniture in New Jersey from the Amish people. You know, the Amish, they take three years to make a chair, right? Because, you know, they can't use electricity. <laughs> Seriously, right? Haven't you seen Witness the movie? <laughs> and then they can't transport it. So then they have to talk to the Mennonites who are a little less orthodox, who will then move your chair for you. So after three years, we got a kitchen set. <laughs> it's true, but it's beautiful. I mean, you know, handcrafted and engraved and all that. And so here we are. What has happened in France and in the UK and in America is that a large portion of people are confused. They feel betrayed. And so what we have are two populist candidates in America. One is gone, one is still there, Donald Trump, as we know. And of course, in England, the Brexit, they are capitalizing on this. So in the case of Donald Trump, what we have, we have people who are, who are for Donald Trump, so we have the idiots, <laughs> we have the racists, <laughs> we have the misogynists, is that women haters? <laughs> I have to learn that word. <laughs> We have the whack jobs, right? And then, and this is the important part, we have good, solid, hard-working, salt of the earth people. That is my big thesis here, and they cannot be ignored. We, sh we shouldn't write them off as being losers and deadbeats. They are confused. They feel betrayed. They are like, what the heck? Four generations been built. Three generations for each other builders. You know, my grandfather, my dad, and now it's being sent off. For what? Look at the stuff that's coming in. So ignoring them, writing those guys off as white jobs, racist, losers, is a mistake. Something is broken. Those guys were supposed to be transitioning into new jobs, according to trade theory. That did not happen, has not been happening. And this has been worrying me for a long time because it bothers me. These things bother me. These are salt of the earth people. And by just dismissing them, like, ah, what do they know? This is a big mistake. It's a dangerous mistake. And so what happened in Brexit, I described Brexit on my blog, 
as a peasant's revolt. There was one in 1326 or something that did not work. It was crushed. Armored knights went in and wiped them out. This peasant's revolt in Britain actually worked. They didn't even know what they were doing. They voted, no, we want out, we're angry. Next morning we all read Robin to Google to see, well, what did we do, right? We saw that. And so I'm gonna take you there. So stay with me and let's go into it. That's right, you don't have notebooks, so well, I'll write you listen. <laughs> so here's my, my blog site, business. And stop me anytime if you have any questions, folks. I'm gonna give you the tip of the ice, tip of the tip of the iceberg. And scroll all the way to the bottom. Okay, so here we are. Let's do Ricardian. I'm gonna give you the basic Ricardian trade theory. Let's start with Adam Smith. Adam Smith is the first guy who shocked the planet. So before Adam Smith, it was all mercantilist trade. Exports are good, imports are bad. And you know, ask Donald Trump that. He would say, well, yeah, no imports, only exports. It's called mercantilism. This was in the 16th, 17th century. So there was a big problem with that. Can you guess what that would be? Just keep exporting. We don't want imports. You, everybody else buys my stuff. What was the problem with that? Can you guess? You're exporting stuff and you're getting gold. What was happening with that is huge bubbles were happening at home. You're basically increasing your money supply. You can't eat gold or specie precious metal coming in. You can't consume it, right? And so that was called a mercantilist model where exports are good, just focus on exports, give me gold. That was causing all kinds of bubbles at home. So Adam Smith, here we go, is the first one who came up and said, Oops. Two countries, A and B. And stay with me here now. So the two countries, A and B, the two countries, the two, two goods, X and Y. It's going to be a very simple examples from today, but it's going to be quite intuitive. X is R and D. And let Y be um, appliances, machines, manufacturing. And so, two, uh, three, four, five. Let's just let's see an example I have for you. Okay, so here we are. This is ALX, ALY, BLX, BLY. What this means in plain English is that it takes two workers to make one middle, right, left. Two workers to make one unit of X in country A. So two workers in A to do one unit of R&D in country A. Here, ALY is five, so five workers to make one unit of appliances, machines in country A. Three to make one of X in B, and four to make one of Y in B. And Adam Smith was the first one who said, look, in this case here, a should basically be making X, because A takes fewer workers to make X. B should do Y, and then they should trade, and they'll both be better off. This was a shock, because here somebody is saying, don't do everything at home. You know, there's no point. You can't do everything at home. You should not do everything at home. You make, you do R&D at home, let the other country do appliances, and then you trade. Then comes David Ricardo. This is the model we've been using today. David Ricardo, this guy was a child genius when he was a little kid, brilliant guy. This is the Ricardian trade theory. This is the, this is the model that drives European Union, NAFTA, all the trade talks today. This is the model. So he came up with this model. A, B, two, five, eight, ten. A, L, X, A, L, Y, BLX, BLY. And again, this is X, so this is um, R&D, and this is appliances. So this is toasters, dishwashers, appliances. Look at this here. So the country A takes two workers for X, country B takes eight. Country A takes two workers to make a toaster, country B takes 10. What should we do here? Should A do both? I mean, what the heck? You know, forget B, or should there be another way out? What do you think? What do you think should happen here? 
I mean, A is making X and Y more efficiently than B. <coughs> what should happen? You have to be. What? Technology transfer. Yeah. Nothing <laughs> 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 has changed, by the way. For those of you joining us for the first time, there are no problems saying no. So if you get along, yeah, it means you know. <laughs> Come on, guys. What you should do with the good at and be sure. He said, so President said, A should do what they're good at. And he should do one. So, but this is five of enigmatic answers, you know. <laughs> so, which one should they make, Faisal? Come on. Um, so, so here you are. So, you know, so what do you do at work? Uh, I'm a service delivery man. Okay. So, so he does. Faisal is at work. So he does um, service delivery management at work. Okay. Faisal also can make great copies for the board meetings on his copy machine. Better, faster than his assistant. So he does his executive work better than his assistant. And he's making, he can make copies on the Xerox machine better than his assistant. Should he just tell an assistant, you know what, I've got it all. Matthew here is running Cisco. He can run Cisco better than his assistant. And he can put more water in the coffee machine at work better than his assistant. So as Matthew say, you know what? You just go ahead. I'll, I'll clean out the coffee machine and take me 45 minutes. I got it. I can do better than you. Watch what should happen. Wow. What was that? Opportunity. Wow. Louder. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. In other words, what's the opportunity? What does that mean from your from your microeconomics days? Put put a Frank McIntyre to this. Yes. What does that mean? Uh, you're trying to value. What the value of the other last time? Second best option. In other words, you know, so you can have Matthew can clearly do that better than the assistant, but it's going to cost him 45 minutes. He'd rather be doing running Cisco than dealing with that. So even though he can do both things better, the opportunity cost of him pick doing other thing, opportunity cost of you making copies to him. So you farm it out. So basically, Ricardo said, look, what you do is countries must specialize in what they have the least opportunity cost. If America can do R&D and appliances better than China in this ratio here, it doesn't mean they can do both as efficiently as, as each other. So America can, should focus on them. So here we are, here's the ratio you need to know. David Ricardo pointed out that if ALX over ALY is less than BLX over BLY, the A should specialize in X. And again, this is very simple, but yet, yet it's very intuitive. So A should specialize in X and B in Y. So let's see the ratio holds. So we have 2 over 5, which is 0.4, is indeed less than 8 over 10, which is 0.8. So in this simple example, country A should focus on R&D because if it, you know, it does it more efficiently, so country B should focus on making appliances, and then they should trade freely. So a country like America, a country like Singapore, should do R&D, services, financial. A country like China, Argentina, Brazil, India. You know, some of our bonuses were 80% of our salary. Some of our bonuses were 100% of our salary. So, okay, I'll send this to um, outside Shanghai. Let's save the snare, hit the target. Merry Christmas. 100%. And we all have the response responsibility. Yeah, we knew that this game couldn't last. We knew that. But, you know, who cares? And so, here we go. It was acknowledged this was a short term approach. So now you understand where I'm, where I'm coming from. Angry Americans feel like they've been betrayed. Feel like, well, what the heck? And what was supposed to happen here, let's go back to what I said earlier. <coughs> Remember those appliance workers making toasters in America? They were shut down because we sent them to Shanghai or Beijing. Those blue collar workers were supposed to transition into new jobs according to Ricardo. We have, America was 80% in agriculture in the late 1800s. Now America is 3% in agriculture. You know, so 
So when they went from farming to low-end manufacturing to assembly manufacturing to high-end manufacturing, and they got jobs eventually. Well, the, the kids got jobs. What's happening now, folks, is the transition is broken. That's another problem. You know, we have Facebook, one billion clients over only 1,700 jobs. Twitter, 800 jobs, something like that. So the new technologies, all these so-called big technologies, are not bringing the attendant jobs. They're not happening. And I don't want to sound like a Luddite, but what we have is a professor called Gordon from Northwestern who has made a living going around saying, and you heard me say this before, nothing big has happened on this planet since Netscape Browser and Google. They gave us the internet. Nothing big after that. So after, immediately you will say, for Facebook, come on. And, my, and you heard this example before, two Swedish scientists did a study of 65 countries to see what Facebook gave us. And so people say, Facebook, come on. You know, you can fight tyranny, fight oppression, exchange of ideas and freedom. Come on, what else? Give me some of the noble virtues of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> like each other's photos. <laughs> yeah, look at this, you know. My little Katrina playing in the snow for 45 minutes. Why would anybody be interested? I don't know. <laughs> and on and on. And so they found out that the main thing Facebook gave us was jealousy. Yeah. <laughs> jealousy and envy. And we discussed this in class. You, know, you went skiing upstate New York. I went skiing in Switzerland. Check it out. <laughs> this is what your boyfriend looks like. Check out my boyfriend. <laughs> By the way, both the boyfriends are photoshopped. <laughs> <laughs> You don't look like any of us, like normal guys. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and yet, there was a website in India, uh, Indian women here, they were there, they posted their boyfriends. It was called shadi.com or something. <laughs> and Apple bought it for 12 million. Wow. And again, Indian, no one seems to acknowledge this fact, but it's true, you know? <laughs> anyway, so what you have here is, so there's all this talk about what do new technologies bring us? There are no jobs. The jobs aren't happening, and the jobs that are happening, these guys don't have the skills for. So what you have is angry Americans, angry Brits, angry French persons, and they're left behind. And it's because you're not using a holistic approach. There was a short-term approach used, you know, the bonuses, and the transition is broken. The new jobs are not happening, and they're angry. And so you have these populist candidates here in UK, in France, tapping into that. And so that's the scary part. This is why it's, it is broken. We have to fix it. But we have to make sure that uh, the leaders of our companies understand this and they just don't outs outsource and discriminate. For Singapore, swinging back to Singapore here, Singapore in many ways, like the US, the focus is going to be on China, that China is slowing down. The focus is on the, uh, Singapore export story. Singapore may be moving into Singapore 3.0. From the early chemical days to the export driven days to IT, financial apps, biotechnology. And we have somebody in the Singapore government here, David, who was in the class. And he told us in class that 25 years ago, Singapore realized that the pharmaceutical story may be flattening out. And they transitioned, they tried to transition the country into biotech. As we actually sent a delegation to Genentech right, to bring them here. So low taxes, low regulation, good government, safe government. Singapore is trying to reinvent itself and do Singapore to Any questions so far? So it looks like you know from the first point you're outsourcing something. Is it is it actual competence, is it actual skills, or is it just cost? Because what happens is Yeah, thank you. His question is, is it just the cost here? And the thing is, if you were to click on this many times, and we can't do it today, you will see that click on this, it'll be marginal product of labor. It's labor productivity. So remember, folks, that you, the reason we are all not selling everything to sub-Saharan Africa, where the salaries are five cents an hour, is not because the absolute wages. So you have Trump going, of course, or Ross Perot going, there's going to be a giant sucking sound as everything moves to sub-Saharan Africa where salaries are five cents an hour. No, it's the productivity. 
It's not the absolute wage, and people don't understand that. <coughs> Anything else? Isn't part of this also driven by the consumer culture and the need for lower prices? And what, what absolute her question, her comment was? Very consumer culture and the need for lower prices. And and you should yeah, and actually in my trade class I have letters to the editor where people are saying, you know, I normally would buy red wing snowshoes, red something. Red Chips. something made in Minnesota. You know, and uh, but they cost so much, and I would love to keep these jobs at home. But the thing is, I got these for sixteen dollars in Costco, made in some Asian country, and they only last six months. But they last one season, and then my kids get bored anyway. And so I'm sorry, but I couldn't buy Red Wing. It was Red Wing, uh, and I had to go. And so what you have, yeah, there's a lot of that. But the thing is, you reach the point now where the companies who are making the stuff here are actually not making any money because out in those countries where we outsourced and offshore, salaries have grown so high, uh, quality has become so bad that they have to hire people like these here to fly back and forth, and the cost savings have pretty much vaporized. So, so that, holds, that whole saga, yeah. So we, I work for Chevron. We've got a manual. Can you hear him? Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a shared service center in Manila. It was started about 20 years ago. And the level of arbitrage was pretty, pretty wide at the point of time. And you mentioned the level of arbitrage. So he's talking about the dispersion here in the yeah. So right now, over the last eight years or so, the Philippine peso has been pretty steady. And in fact, uh, the attrition rate in our service services is something like about 25 to 30%. So the, the wages are going up almost 15% per annum. So now we have reached a stage where it's kind of, it doesn't make any sense to send stuff over there. The problem is to bring it back into yeah. Singapore and any place, we don't have people that can do that stuff anymore. So that's what's happened. So did you hear him everyone? Mm -hmm. So if he's talking about studying stuff to Philippines, and specifically what were you sending over? Mostly accounting. Accounting. Back and he said what's happened is, and again, keep in mind, this is all micro. When you put in macro effects like currencies, you have to understand the profit margins are razor thin. You know this. This is your world. An example I like to give is we got Ember shirts made from New Jersey by Lanzen. We got one batch made, they ran out in two weeks. We got another batch made from Lanzen, the color was off. The logo was different. You know, so I called Lanzen and said, what the heck? It's been two weeks. You know, the navy blue is different. And Lanzen said, oh, this new batch came from uh, Philippines. The old batch was from China. The currencies moved like 0.2%. And so when that happens, we swing around. Because the profit margins are raised thin. The problem is you can't bring stuff back. The stuff is gone. Those guys here who couldn't transition, those kids of these guys have moved on to other things. And those lives, uh, the, the lights have gone out. They are angry. They feel betrayed. And they're looking around saying, as, as the lady said, you know, the stuff, that, I would understand if the stuff you brought in from other countries was good. But this stuff is, look at it, just breaks apart. Look at it. Why did we do this? And here comes Donald Trump who will say, oh, the foreigners, we're going to keep trade out. We're going to build the wall. Everyone goes, yay. And you have to understand where this is coming from. So what are you doing now since you can't bring it back? A lot of complaining, but there's nothing we can do. He said a lot of complaining. <laughs> Unless you find another country and start all this over again, that's the problem. You know, where, where else will you go? You're kind of maxing out. And so I talked so in the last few minutes I have. So I learned from... My friend back there who told me many years ago um, that in Singapore, when you Singaporeans are stressed and have psychological problems and emotional problems, you get into a cab and speak to uncle. That's it, right? I'll never forget that. And so I asked him, well, what if you don't have to go anywhere? And he said, no, you just go down the block, round and round. And if you don't like what he's saying, then go in the other direction. That's <laughs> made that up. <laughs> and so, well, I spoke to my uncles, my taxi uncles, the last few days, and I said, Uncle, so China is all around you. They're coming in manufacturing, they're coming in services, they're coming in financial applications. WeChat is brilliant. And now they're building this canal across Thailand. What's it called? Dragon Canal? Golden Silk Canal? Silk, okay. It's Dragon Silk or Golden. One of the three. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Uncle, I mean, so if they build the canal, they're going to cut off the whole Malacca Straits. You know, aren't you worried? He just turned and looked at me and said, 
China? Worried about China? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't you hear what I said? They're the coming in, the building a canal, and coming here, and the building airliners, and, and, and the air service is very good. And he looked at me and he said, listen. I said, are you worried about China? I said, yeah, I'm worried about China. I said, okay, I'm going to get some deep insights from uncle. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said, my big problem is, in the food courts, they're all Chinese who are doing the cooking. I'm talking about the canal. <laughs> hey, well, he said, so when you go to the, the Malaysian food place, it's Chinese. You go to the Thai place, it's not Thai, it's Chinese. Chinese, Chinese, except Indians. They cannot copy Indians. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> and so I was talking to him, and it was just oddly reassuring. It was like a comforting thing. And I said, but, but Uncle, did you hear what I said about the future of Singapore and, and, and you know, planning ahead and, and you have to be proactive? He said, ah, oh, don't worry about that. Food courts, you listen to me, he said. Only go where old people are cooking because they're real Singaporeans. <laughs> I said, okay, 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 I've got that. But what about the country? And he said, my government will take care of us. You know, and so that is huge. Singapore is a safe haven country. Singapore, US, South Korea, Japan, and now India. But the list is small. Switzerland, maybe. Uh, Germany, yeah. But so a safe haven country, and so and it was a, and this was a huge comment he made. Our government will take care of us. This government has been preemptive and proactive. You know, when the Asian crisis happened, or when the dot um, financial crisis happened in 2008, as I discussed in class today, in one week's time, Singapore had a relief plan. One week. We wouldn't, Congress wouldn't have met for six months, <laughs> right? One week's time, they had a plan to help employers 25% uh, salary assistance. Um, last year, we did safe haven bond sales. Maha writes to the government. You know, like, you know what? We should do bond financing. Now, maybe Maha, you are the guy. You are the reason that they have bonds now. <laughs> no, it, it just happened that. Uh, <laughs> in October, Singapore's issuing government bonds. I'd like to tell people that, wow, this is the Maha is the guy. Maybe send it next door to that. And so, so that's what's happened. Singapore's made so many, you know, and Malaysians who make, can I, you know, make fun of Singaporeans, oh, you know, you do everything the government says, you follow every rule. Singaporeans go, yeah, because the rules have worked. They've saved us over and over again. Singapore and China were the only two countries who ignored the IMF in the Asian crisis. My hero, Dr. Hu, and my Chinese hero, Zhu Rongji, basically told the IMF, that advice you gave us is wrong. No, excuse me, we're not doing it. And there were the two countries that were saved over and over again. And so I'm not worried for the taxi, for the uncle to say I'm worried only about food is only reassuring. It means all will be well, not to worry. Thank you very much and thank you for being here.